All right, everybody, welcome to First Attack. I am your host, James Chen, a.k.a. Jay Chenzor. How is everybody going? Um, so for those of you who are new to First Attack, um, basically what I try to do on First Attack is always go over some... You know, I try to teach people how to play fighting games, and, you know, this can vary anywhere from high-level stuff to really low-level stuff and, and very basic concept and fundamentals. So, um, you know, if... Hopefully you guys are familiar with the show and you've if not you can check the backlog as well I've gone through all sorts of things. That's on youtube.com slash ultra chen TV We've gone over a lot of uh, very basic topics there. Just look for all the first attack shows there Sometimes we go over new games that have come out and all sorts of cool things like that but again one of the things that I do definitely try to do is to teach how to approach fighting games, how to teach fundamentals. And it's it's really hard because there's not a lot of information out there on how to get into fighting games. And a lot of times when you go into fighting games, it feels like you're just kind of blindly poking around and just hoping something happens, hoping something sticks, and hoping something actually happens. And, 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 and one of the things that you'll hear when David and I do commentary a lot of time is that, you know, sometimes when we're commentating, commentating early pool matches, we'll be saying things like, you know, it just doesn't feel like this guy has a game plan or I don't think he really has an idea of what to try, etc., etc. So there's a lot of different aspects of uh, fighting game fundamentals. But, you know, just recently uh, I was having different conversations with a bunch of different people and then uh, Rising Thunder just came out. And um, I started messing with some of the characters in training mode and then I went online just this past weekend to play. Um, and I started thinking about what I was doing. Like, it, I don't know what came over me, but I, it just, I just thought about it. And I was like, this is my game plan. This is how I'm trying to open up my opponents and everything. And then I thought about streaming something, you know, informal. I was just going to play Rising Thunder online and just kind of explain to people what I'm trying to do. But then I thought to myself, the concept of opening up your opponent is probably something that's so... Like, it's so core to fighting games, to playing fighting games, yet so many people don't know how to do it. So many people do not understand the concept of opening the opponent up. And really, honestly, that's like one of the key concepts of fighting games. If you don't know how to open people up in fighting games, there's really pretty much you're not going to succeed, <laughs> okay? Let's just, let's just put it out there. You're not going to succeed if you can't open up the opponents. That's the whole point of fighting games is how to open them up, is how to get the damage and how to start winning. So this is just a huge, huge factor of fighting games. And so, I, you know what? I, I said, you know what? I'm not going to do this little crazy casual stream. I'm going to try to turn this into a formal lesson. So I'm going to do this whole big old first attack on this and talk about this. And so, yes, today's topic is how to open up your opponents. And it's going to be interesting because when I talk about it, it's going to seem very simple or it's going to seem like, well, that's it. But, you know, as I keep going, you're going to start understanding why fighting games have all these different layers when it comes to opening up opponents. It sounds really simple because, you know, when I say certain things like, oh, have a good high-low game, you know, it's like, oh, well, duh. But there's so much more to it than that. And so let's go ahead and get into it right away. Uh, I haven't done this in a while here, which is uh, busting out the, ta-da, uh, this way over here, ta-da, the PowerPoint slides. That's right, I have busted out the PowerPoint slides again, and we are going to go over the concept right now of how to open up your opponents. Now, I'm going to go over kind of a summary here and then go into each little item detailed one by one. So... Here we go. The first thing that I want to talk about when it comes to opening up your opponents is the concept of blocking. And blocking is the ultimate defense. Now, we'll get into that a little bit. Now, then I'm going to talk about the common ways to open up your opponents that you'll see across most fighting games 
with different degrees between them. There's four main ways that I've categorized uh, how to open up your opponents. And you're gonna see how they uh, vary differently between games. And it's really interesting because it, it changes so much between game to game. But at the same time, the ways to open them up are usually pretty similar. So um, they're, they're universal across games, like I said, to varying degrees. Uh, yeah, so again, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about different games and which mix-ups apply to which games and varies and the variations within games and such like that. And then finally, all this talk about mix-ups is really going to lead into the concept of fundamentals and footsies. And um, one of the hardest things to describe in fighting games is the neutral game, fundamentals, footsies, which I categorize all into the same category. Um, in fact, at EVO, Hanzo Gonzo asked me at one point in time, he's like, how would you describe footsies or how would you describe the neutral game? Because I really want to put together like something that talks about that. And I didn't get a chance to really describe it to him, but I'll describe it here and I'll talk to you about where fundamentals and footsies comes into play when it comes to mixing up your opponent. I'm not gonna get into fundamentals and footsies because that's a whole episode all by itself. And I've done little bits of episodes here and there that have gone over the concept. But the most important thing is I wanna show how it relates to mix-ups. So um, we'll get into that at the very, very end here. All right, <clears throat> so let's go ahead and start here. Let's start with blocking which I have called the ultimate defense, okay? Because from the get-go, with every fighting game that you play, this is not a true, everything has a caveat, okay? But in general, most of the fighting games you're gonna play, blocking is the ultimate defense. And in fact, I wanna put this in your mind right now, blocking is OP, blocking is overpowered, okay? Defense, needs to be good in fighting games. Okay, so blocking is overpowered. If I'm playing Street Fighter and I'm holding down back on the controller, there's really not much you can do to me because I'm defending everything, right? If I'm playing Mortal Kombat and I'm holding the block button, what are you gonna do, right? So you, you gotta do something to me. So the whole concept of mix-ups here, I, I really, really, really want to get this point across, is that the entire concept of mix-ups is you are trying to scare the opponent from blocking. So you, the whole point of getting a victory in this game is to hit the opponent. And the only way that you're gonna hit the opponent is if you can get them to stop blocking because blocking is overpowered. And I really, really want people to understand that. Yes, and some people are saying this in the, in the, you know, in the chat, blocking is really cheap. But I want people to understand that. I want people to understand how good blocking is in a fighting game. Because as soon as you understand that, as soon as you appreciate that, as soon as you believe in that, that's what makes your mix-ups better. That's what makes your mix-ups more rewarding. And that will actually get you to grasp how much work it is to open your opponent up. And, and it's not... Because the problem with it is, let's face it, a lot of times people are like, this was an argument that like me and my brother used to get into when we played Street Fighter 2, like hyper fighting. You know, we would be playing and the other guy would turtle in the corner and we're like, why do you play so defensive? You're playing so lame, why don't you play for real? And you know, it was always just that way to call someone out. Like, you know, I can't beat your blocking, so I'm gonna call you names, basically. And I'm gonna try to make you feel bad for blocking because that's really, honestly, the only way I can win is if you don't play defense. Interesting thing is, nowadays, when I play fighting games, when I watch fighting games, when I commentate fighting games, that's not even in my mind. That doesn't even cross my mind. If I see someone playing super defensive and they're playing super turtly, super lame, as the term has been, uh, as you hear oftentimes, even will say that, oh, he's playing so lame. And I don't even mean it as, a, as, a, as an insult. You know, nowadays, it's just the word that's described it. But actually, it's kind of a compliment now. If the opponent can't beat it, then that's their fault. It's 100% their fault. Because you know what? We've seen all defenses broken before. 
And if somebody else can break the defense, so can you, okay? So that's a very important thing. So again, when you approach a fighting game, so later on in the episode, so this first half of this episode is gonna be these wonderful PowerPoint slides. But uh, in the second half of the episode, when I go into Rising Thunder, when I start playing the game, when you start learning a character, when you start messing with the character, the first thing you have to do is figure out how to get past blocking. That is the first thing that you should really try to decide on when you start jumping into a fighting game. If you jump into a fighting game and you have no idea, like you can sit there and learn all the combos that you want. You'd be like, oh dude, I have this really sick combo that starts from point blank low jab. And then you play a real match and it's like, you can't even get point blank. You can't even get the low jab. What is the point of this, right? Who cares about your combo? In fact, why are they even going to get hit by the low jab, right? It's just not even going to happen because it's not a realistic situation to land your hit. You really need to have a mix-up to land a hit, and that's how you have to start figuring out your combos. You have to figure out the, the optimal starting from a mix-up connecting, and that's how you're actually going to start landing a lot of these combos. Oftentimes, you'll do something like, for example, you'll watch Marvel, and you'll see someone do some sick incoming mix-up, and you're like, that's so sick, I'm gonna copy this. But you know what? There's so much more to it than just, this is a trick. You really have to understand why it works and where the mix-up comes from. If you don't have an idea of what the mix-up is, it's not really gonna be particularly useful. Okay, here we go. So let's get into the meat of this, okay? Let's get into the meat. I'm gonna talk about how to open up your opponent, and again, this is going to be four main categories that I'm going to talk about here. And again, this is going to seem really intuitive. This is going to seem really duh. Like, why are you even explaining this to me? But it's, it's really important because when you understand these ideas of opening your opponent up, it really, really helps you understand how to approach a new game. When you jump into a new game, you're automatically looking for these meth methods of opening pe people up. So here we go. Here's the four main characters of opening people up. High-low mix-ups, right? Very obvious. Overheads, lows. You know, really all you're trying to do is overcome... Well, I'll get into this in a little bit detail, a little bit more. But yeah, so high-low mix-ups. Very, 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 um, you know, obvious, obvious one here. Second one is left-right mix-ups. So this is the cross-up. This is, for example, the characters that can pass through you and catch you on the other side by surprise. Um, yeah, again, seems very obvious, right? Left-right mix-ups. Next one, and this one's actually really important, is the throw game. So obviously one of the best ways to defeat blocking is just by throwing the opponent because that is exactly what throws are designed to do. They are designed to beat blocking because again blocking is overpowered without throwing there's really no way to beat blocking except for these little mix-ups and depending on the game that may or may not be enough um and the last one actually is chip damage pressure this one uh i don't think people give enough credit to and uh it's really interesting and different games have this again by, by different varied amounts but uh, this is basically, you just keep doing damage little by little to them, even while they are blocking, so much to the point that they become nervous and they wanna do something. Again, I'll go through all of these in detail one by one. Um, now, there are obviously going to be all sorts of different ways to have, um, there's the also every fighting game is different, right? Every fighting game is different. There's a lot of game specific ways to defeat blocking that are specific to certain games. Whoops, I did not have that listed here. Okay, well, I'll name them myself then. For example, uh, guard meter, right? Guard meter, in fact, I, I actually I might go into it later on in one of the slides. Um, guard meter is one example. Uh, in fact, let's just go on to the next slide because I think I did list it over there. So. Here we go. So opening up your opponents continued. Let's go into each one of these little by little here. So high-low mix-up, left-right mix-up. Basically, the whole concept of directional blocking with the joystick, the concept that you have to low block for low attacks, high block for high attacks, 
you know, if you're on the left side and your opponent's on the right side, you gotta block by holding left. If you're on the opposite situation, you gotta block by holding right. The whole concept of left and right high-low mix-ups is just taking advantage of the fact that there's multiple directions to block and getting them to block in the incorrect direction. There's a lot of ways to accomplish this. Uh, a lot of the games have it built in. For example, uh, Mortal Kombat just has high-lows that lead into big damage combos. Uh, Street Fighter relies a lot on empty jumps uh, to get a lot of damage uh, with certain characters. Um, there's left-right mix-ups, for example. Uh, characters like Milia in Guilty Gear are super good at left-right mix-ups. Fuerte, Viper are good at left-right mix-ups and such like that. Now, the tricky thing about left-right mix-ups, though, is that a lot of times when players think about these kind of mix-ups, one of the biggest mistakes that they actually try is that they are not good at maximizing the results of their mix-up and as well as that it's too risky it's too risky so for example let's talk about a high-low mix-up here right um, bison bison in Street Fighter 4 sometimes you know from a screen away you see your opponent dancing back and forth you want to go for a slide because you want to catch them low because they're walking back and forth this could be considered a low mix-up, you know, because you, you guys are playing this little dancing game here. But if it gets blocked, chances are you're going to get destroyed unless you have meter to FADC out of it, right? Um, so it's not necessarily a great mix-up. So it's not something that I would recommend going for. And in fact, um, when you play a game like Mortal Kombat, very, very reliant on high-low mix-ups. But the goal really is in that game is to come up with high-low mix-ups that are safe on block or that you can go down a different path. So a lot of the times you can hit confirm or not hit confirm. Again, I have a whole uh, previous episode on hit confirming if you guys want to check that out. But um, so for example, in MK, you could do stuff where you go for a high attack and if it hits, then you cancel your string into a special. If it doesn't hit if, and they block, you don't do the special and then it's safe on block. So in a game like Mortal Kombat, when you jump into that game and you first start approaching that game, one of the first things that you do is you go and look for high and low mix-ups. You look for combos that start from a high you look for combos that start from a low or that there is a low in the middle of the chain, for example, and then you try to find a way to make it safe. Finding a high-low mix-up is not enough necessarily just to have a good mix-up. If it's unsafe, then it's, it's it, you know, you might end up taking more damage going for this mix-up than you would if you actually, you know, landed them. You really have to maximize your rewards for it. Sometimes in a game like Guilty Gear, for example, the low starters to a lot of your mix-ups are going to be uh, 2Ks or crouching kicks. Crouching kicks naturally reduce the damage of a lot of your combos. So maximizing the damage and such like that might not necessarily be what you're worried about. Uh, you might actually be just trying to maximize the reward. So for example, after you hit him with a, a, a low kick, you want to end your combo in a knockdown so you get a better mix-up later on. But you're using this high and low mix-up to get you into better mix-ups. We'll get into that in a little bit later. So again, all it really is high-low, left-right mix-ups. And again, this is going to sound really obvious. Like, why are you even telling me this? This is very basic stuff. Exactly. But it's very important to know that these are two of the standard categories of mix-ups that you're going to want to go into. Next main one is the throw game, right? So the throw game is really important because, as we mentioned in one of the earlier slides, the whole point of mix-ups is to get your opponent scared to block. Blocking is overpowered. So how do we convince the opponent to stop blocking? That is such a key concept. And throws, which is the direct counter to blocking, is really, really useful here. This is going to help you convince people to stop blocking because if they block too much, obviously you're going to get the throw in there, right? So 
as you play, when when you start getting the threat of the throw in there, a lot of the times that's what opens the opponent up a lot of the times. So they're going to try to hit buttons to stop you from throwing them. They're going to try to jump away. They're going to backdash. They're going to start moving. They're going to stand up, which opens them up for the low game. Lots of things happen when you actually get into the throw game. There was actually someone I played in a fighting game a long time ago, actually. This was back when throws were kind of like considered cheap and nobody really wanted to do them. Um, there was a person that I played that he was playing on the machine. He was beating everybody because he was turtling because he was just sitting there. And um, basically what I said was, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to throw you because that's all you're doing is blocking. And I threw him one time and it completely derailed his game. All of a sudden he couldn't play at all. And in fact, every time I got anywhere near him, he freaked out and started trying to jump away, hit buttons. So I blew him up and then he was like, oh, you're going to throw. Huh? I'll show you how cheap throws are. And he tried to throw me, and then I just blew him up for trying to do that. And so even though he played really solidly against everybody else by having this defense, I threw him one time and it completely shattered his game. You'd be surprised at how much this actually works. And uh, again, Street Fighter, very, very heavy into the throw game and scaring them out of uh, blocking. And again... This is going to be another one of the key ways that you're going to try to learn to open up your opponent is by through the throw game. And again, you know, throws sometimes, depending on the game, aren't going to do so much damage. You're going to have games like Street Fighter where the throw is the damage that you get. And so pretty much you need to take advantage of that by starting to get your mix-ups going afterwards. So you've used the throw mix-up, just like I talked about the left, right, and high-low mix-ups. You've used your mix-ups to go into better mix-ups. So you're using the throw to be able to land cross-ups, media attacks, all sorts of kind of interesting things like that. Um, other games like Guilty Gear, some characters can combo off of the throws. Especially in Marvel, everyone can combo off of throws. So that's really important as well. Um, so you really have to maximize your throw results because the throws in general in most games will reward you the least for defeating their block. And so if that's the case, if you can't maximize the damage off of the throw, a lot of the opponents that you're going to face against are going to be willing to take the throw. And uh, they won't hit buttons as much. So you're not scaring them out of blocking enough. They're just going to play down back all day, not do anything. You're going to throw them and then not get anything out of it. And so they're like, big deal. I'm just going to keep playing this defense here. So you really have to make sure that you maximize your throw uh, in order to get them to stop blocking. Now, once you start showing them that you can maximize damage off of the throw, this kind of goes back, for example, to AE 2012 Cami. Um, before, it was better just to take the throws from Cami because her frame traps did so much damage. But once... She, uh, Cami players started perfecting the unblockables and the vortex and the, you know, ambiguous dive kicks and jump attacks. That's when all of a sudden people stopped wanting to take the throw. And that's what pretty much rocketed Cami up to, you know, top tier status in that game. That's what made her one of the best characters because her throw was so threatening. And then, of course, there's chip damage pressure. Um, basically, this is just forcing your opponents into moving and into mistakes. A lot of the things that I've talked about, these high-low mix-ups, left-right mix-ups, throw game, has all been close-range stuff. But chip damage pressure is actually interesting because you don't have to be anywhere near your opponent to actually have this pressure work. Fireball game, for example, one of the greatest examples of chip damage pressure. Um, you know, Ryu can be sitting back there on the other side of the screen. He's losing the match. You know, you have about this much of a life lead out of, you know, you have like this much of a life lead. And so, you know what, I'm just going to sit back here. And then Ryu starts chucking fireballs at you. You're not going to sit there and block that all day because you're going to take a ton of chip damage. So what ends up happening is you are start jumping. You start neutral jumping. You start forward jumping. Focus dash through. You're trying to come up with all sorts of different ways to prevent yourself from being chipped. And that opens you up, for example, like Chun-Li will do Fireball FADC, you try to neutral jump it and all of a sudden she roundhouses you out of the air, or she gets Jump Fierce, Jump Fierce out of the air into Ultra. So even though it doesn't seem like Chun-Li's really applying pressure through the Fireball because the chip damage is so minute, it's still a really big deal because 
you're still trying to move and you're still trying to avoid the fireball. So it creates, it forces you into action. This also happens when, for example, Fei Long does EX Rekkas and you're sitting there blocking EX Rekkas and you know you can't punish it and he's got all this meter. You just don't want to take all that chip damage. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting that um, one of the things, actually, uh, we'll get into that, Hong, uh, about chip damage pressure in Street Fighter V. It's actually going to be more so than before. Uh, but what's interesting is that, you know, fireball pressure from a screen away forces, and like if the opponent keeps reacting and neutral jumping and doing all sorts of stuff, you'll see a lot of people like Guile just keep throwing fireball or Ryu will keep throwing fireball. Poison will keep throwing fireballs because the opponent's moving and eventually they'll make mistakes and you'll take advantage of it. The ultimate example of what happens when you take that threat away was Gamer B versus Infiltration at EVO. If you remember, Infiltration picked Chun-Li and Gamer B had Elena with healing. So Infiltration was trying to apply this chip damage pressure game by throwing lots of fireballs, by getting Gamer B to attack him. But as soon as Gamer B negated that by focusing all the fireballs and continuously healing herself, that really put a damper on Infiltration's plans and he really did not have the ability to continue that pressure. So he had to do something and it eventually cost him the match because he, I think he threw too much fireball. He was too used to that. But you can see a big difference where if you don't have that option that Elena had, which was focused dash and healing all the time, the opponent can be willing to sit there and throw fireballs all day and just use this chip damage pressure to defeat you. And it's, it's really, really effective in a lot of ways. For another one is Bison. When Bison gets you in the corner, starts doing scissor kick pressure, you're not going to sit there and block scissor kicks all day because it's just going to keep adding up little by little by little. It forces you into action. It forces you to jump, which is when he gets the either stand roundhouse or he gets the EX head stomp on you. Uh, you start hitting buttons, and so then you can whiff punish them with your own scissor kick or catch them low with low forward scissor kick. The chip damage pressure is a very important um, method of opening up your opponents. So those are the four main ones, right? Left-right mix-ups, high-low mix-ups, the throw game, and the chip damage pressure. Now there are some game-specific stuff, as I was getting into a little bit earlier. Uh, for example, some games just have unblockables. Yadagarasu, for example, has moves that specifically if they hit you while you're blocking, you will go into like a guard crush animation and they can get combos on you for that. Um, other games like Alpha 3 have guard meters, CVS 2. If you block too much, block normal moves too much, you just get guard broken and then they can land a combo on you. So again, these are very uh, game specific ways to open up the opponent. In fact, some games may just have no blocking at all whatsoever, a.k.a. Dive Kick, <laughs> right? So Dive Kick is a game where the reason why um, opponents can't just sit there and turtle is because you can't block at all. So it, it gets really, really... Um, the, the blocking is not overpowered in that game for that reason right there. All right, so... Um, Let's talk about the games, for example. This, this is where you start getting into how to approach a game. So the reason why I want to talk about this so much, and may, although it may seem obvious to a lot of players who are very used to fighting games, the reason why I want to bring this up is because every game has different levels of each of these mix-ups. And when you first jump into a game, you really need to quickly assess which mix-up is valuable in the game. And once you figure that out, one, that's when you start messing around with your character and start playing around with all sorts of different kind of mix-ups. So for example, let's say you're playing Mortal Kombat, you jump into Mortal Kombat, you come from Street Fighter, and you're used to cross-ups, you're used to all these cool left-right mix-ups, so you develop all these neat little left-right mix-up options, right? So you're like, oh, look, this is a really ambiguous jump, et cetera, et cetera. There's a block button in the game. There is no left-right mix-up in Mortal Kombat. So if you spend all your time in trading mode trying to develop left-right mix-ups, and, and don't laugh at this because 
it's happened. I've actually sat there before and been like, ooh, this is a really ambiguous jump, or this is a really good left-right mix-up. I've seen David do the same thing. He was like, this is a really good trick because you can't tell which side you're going to show up on. It just doesn't work because <laughs> there's a block button. It's you, I, I mentioned the whole concept of left-right mix-ups and high-low mix-ups is to mess up because of directional blocking. If there's no directional blocking, you really can't open people up that way. So you really have to know how to open people up for the game, specific games. So, so let's go over games one by one here. Let's talk about all the different games here. Let's talk about Tekken real quick. Tekken is a game that has no chip damage. Tekken is also a game where if you leave the controller at neutral, you automatically block left or right. So there's really no left or right mix-ups. There's really no chip damage in this game. So throws are a factor in the game, but if you watch high-level Tekken, throws are teched a lot, right? You can kind of see now why. Tekken is built so heavily around the high-low game because it is, it is the predominant mix-up in the game. And so the high-low has to be very threatening and it has to be very effective. So when you're running into Tekken and you're trying to learn Tekken, you really have to understand you're looking for high-low game. So you realize that there's really no left-right mix-up, there's no chip damage pressure, so you're, so you're not going to be able, so you're not going to approach this game looking for those kind of things. This is one of the reasons why, before I get into the other games, this is one of the reasons why top players are so good at so many different games. They take those four fundamental mix-up types, and they look at the game that they're playing, and they immediately know what kind of mix-up to look for. They immediately know what kind of mix-up to invent. And that's why they adapt to these games so fast. Sometimes you watch top players and you're like, how the heck do they get into these games so quickly? And this is one of the reasons why. It's because they understand the concept of opening up the opponent. They quickly evaluate a game to see what the mix-up options that are viable are and then they can apply that right away. So using their vast game knowledge, they're thinking, okay, this game is a left-right mix-up game. Since I've played a few other games that have left-right mix-ups, I'm gonna try to invent something very similar to the stuff that I've seen before. So they can approach games very quickly, they can get in there very fast, and um, that's what makes them very strong in different fighting games. They understand this very quickly. As I've talked about before, Mortal Kombat, also very high-low pressure game. So this game, high lows is so dangerous in this game, but that's because there's no left-right mix-up. If you can't get them to get confused between left-right, you know, you have to have a way to open up the game. If the game was designed so that high-low blocking wasn't such a threat, it'd be really hard to open up people in Mortal Kombat. So again, you see why, like Tekken, Mortal Kombat has a very concentrated high-low game. A lot of people complain about Mortal Kombat, it's just a 50-50 game, but you can see why, because the throws aren't nearly as effective as some other games, and there's no left-right mix-up, so you have to make the high-low really strong. So that becomes a huge factor, so when you go into Mortal Kombat, you try to find high-low pressure. Now, of course, um, chip damage is a huge factor in this game, because all normals do chip damage. That is such an important thing, and that will get people to stop blocking. So a lot of the times you'll see, um, you know, Raiden has those lightning attacks that hit you six times, and you just take this gob of chip damage and such. Um, there was another character that had very Aquaman-like spears that did a ton of chip damage. I can't remember which MK character it was, but um, again, chip damage, very important. So... A lot of times if your opponent is sitting there blocking in the corner all the time, remember I said blocking is OP, blocking is too good. In Mortal Kombat, sometimes you might not even care. You say, you know what, go ahead, keep blocking. I'm just gonna keep this pressure, I'm gonna keep attacking you, you're just gonna take all this chip damage and I'm gonna win eventually anyway. So that's gonna force the opponent out of blocking and they have to try something and that is what forces them into a mistake. Street Fighter 4, very, very throw heavy game. Probably what a lot of people don't realize is I feel like the throw 
mix-up game is the number one mix-up of Street Fighter 4. Throw mix-ups open up frame traps. And you'll see, at high-level play, this game is all about frame traps. Everyone is going for frame traps all day, right? And in case you're new to the concept of frame traps, basically that's getting your opponent to touch a button so that you can hit them during their startup. And um, that opens them up for damage. So for example, walking up to someone, getting them scared to throw, they crouch tech, you hit them while their short's coming out, you get this big old damage. Street Fighter 4 is very, very, very heavy in the throw mix-up game. It's actually why I personally feel like the game is very balanced in a weird way, is because the mix-up, the main mix-up of Street Fighter 4 is pretty much the same mix-up for every character. The reason why you can see someone like Eduardo PR Balrog do so well with Balrog is because he plays this throw mix-up game like nobody's business. He plays it so good, so well, compared to most people, and probably one of the best ones there is at that. So he can succeed with a character like Balrog, who has so many deficiencies, right? Who's a character who can't really open you up with high lows and such like that. So most of the characters can do that. Justin, example, Ricky, they're really good at blowing up... Um, people by getting in and using the throw mix-up with Rufus. Rufus, again, another terrible character, right? Uh, not a terrible character, but not a great character. So again, Street Fighter 4 largely revolves around the throw game. Now, I've included left, right here because the best characters in the game are the ones with the vortex, with the ambiguous jumps, with the unblockables and the cross-ups and stuff like that. So on top of having the throw game mix-up, Left, right, if you have the ambiguous jumps, what side am I landing on? I, what side are you have to block this? And, you know, all these vortexy kind of things. That's what puts you as a top tier character. That's what makes you better than the other characters because you have more than just the throw game. But honestly, outside of that, it's really the throw game. That's actually where most of the damage, interestingly, comes from in this game because people are actually scared to let you get in throw range. They want to keep you out, and so there's this pressure game, and that's what causes people to hit buttons, and that's where all the damage comes from. So I would honestly classify Street Fighter IV as a very, very high-level uh, throw mix-up uh, game. Street Fighter II, on the other hand, Obviously, the throw game is really deadly in Street Fighter 2. I'm talking hyper fighting. I'm talking um, super turbo. But actually, it's really the chip pressure that is a problem in that game because chip pressure is freaking scary in this game because so many special moves are safe on block. And so a lot of the action in super turbo comes from chip damage. So what's really interesting is if you know this and you go in and playing Super Turbo to bring it back into the game evaluation, you go in and play Super Turbo, you don't even have to worry about left-right mix-ups. You don't even have to worry about high-low mix-ups. Th those are icing on the cake if you have those kind of things. Meanwhile, I'm just going to sit here and chuck Hadoukens at you. I'm just going to scissor kick you all day. I'm going to do Honda headbutts and hand slaps all day at you, and you're just going to take it. You're going to have to block it, and you're going to have to live with it. Very few things are punishable on block. In fact, even Ken jab uppercut. I'm going to walk up to you and jab uppercut. You're going to block it and you're going to like it and you're not going to punish me. <laughs> my invincible jab uppercut is safe on block. Cammy, my uppercut against Zangief and T-Hawk and against like 60% of the cast is safe on block. So chip damage is a huge factor of Super Turbo. And... um that is the main way that you're opening people up in that game. And so when you go and play this game, you don't even care about the cross-ups aren't even really necessarily that important in that game because most cross-ups are obvious. There's one or two characters that have ambiguous cross-ups, a.k.a. Uh, M. Bison, like for example, M. E.G., I should say, E.G. M. Bison. He has ambiguous cross-ups, which can hit from the front or back, very specific. But for the most part, most characters have very specific, like if it's going to cross-up, you can totally tell, and it's not very ambiguous. At the distances where it is ambiguous, you'll beat it with an uppercut. So the left-right mix-up is not a huge factor in Street Fighter II. It really comes down to the chip damage and, of course, the throw game because throw range is ridiculous. Throws are one frame and they do a crap ton of damage. 
uh, and so throws are actually hugely important in Super, in Street Fighter 2 as well. So, uh, Smash. Let's talk about Smash Brothers here. Uh, I know a lot of people in here, but oh, Smash Brothers, whatever, not a fighting game. Whatever. Whatever. Smash Brothers is 100% a fighting game. Interestingly enough, if you watch Smash Brothers at high level play, the game is all about the throw. We've come back to the throw again. Because really, that throw causes so much problem for the opponent. Because not only do a lot of characters get combos off of their throw, but it also puts the opponent up in the air and now they have to deal with trying to land. Being on the ground is very important in Smash. I don't know if I can explain this enough. If you're not familiar with watching Smash, whoever's in the center of the stage on the ground has the advantage. The opponent who's in the sky falling or flying or wherever here, he is at a massive disadvantage. And that's what the throws lead to. We've talked about maximizing your throws, getting the most out of your throws. This is a perfect example of a situation. In Smash Brothers, you have to be able to maximize your throws. And of course, there's also game-specific stuff in there. You can shield block. There's no high-low. There's no left-right mix-up, right? Smash has no left-right, no high-low mix-up. In fact, there's no chip damage mix-up. There's, there's none of that, right? If you block, you, you're just not taking any damage. So literally the throw is one of the main things. But another factor is the game specific mechanic in that there's guard break. Uh, if you hold shield too long, your shield starts to shrink so it covers you less. And if you hold it too long, it breaks and you fall dizzy and then the opponent can blow you up. If you block a lot of moves, it generally just shrinks your shield with every hit. And in fact, in a lot of the later Smash games, they've designed it so that there are moves that are specifically there to break your guard in one hit. There are literally some moves that as soon as you block it, your guard gets broken and that's it. You, the opponent gets a free hit. Um, my favorite example of this is with Ryu in Super Smash Bros. for Wii U. Uh, he's got the overhead punch. And since the overhead punch doesn't work the same way it did before, what they decided to do is implement it that if the opponent blocks and you hit him with the overhead punch, instant guard break, Ryu gets a full combo on you. It's so sick, it's such a cool idea. But um, again, Smash Brothers, no left right mix up, no high low mix up, no chip damage mix up, it's all about the throw and it's all about wearing away their guard. So if you're trying to learn Smash and you're playing it from a, and you're coming from Street Fighter, you really have to change your mentality that the mix-up is not about the high-low. It's really about throws and getting them to lose their guard and scaring them enough. Like, I don't want to sit here and block and lose all my guard, so now I'm going to roll or I'm going to spot dodge or I'm going to try to run away. And that's how you open them up. Again, it's not necessarily defeating their guard that will, it's not defeating the block that is what's going to get you a successful mix up. It's a lot of times it's a threat of the mix up forcing the opponent to let go of block. That is what gets you the victory. Very, very important concept. I'll, I'll say it again. A lot of times the direct mix up is not what will get you the hits and the win. It's the threat of the mix up. Uh, I'll get into that in a little bit more in a, in a, in a later example. Uh, Killer Instinct. Killer Instinct, not a huge amount of left-right, in my opinion. Um, not a lot of like crazy chip damage. To me, this game is very throw-heavy. This is a very, very throw-heavy game. When you watch it at high levels, there's a lot of throw mix-ups, especially because the throw... Um, has so much delay on the whiff throw that neutral jumps punish it. So the throw is, an, again, very very similar to Street Fighter. Instead of frame traps, you neutral jump. Because there's no crouch teching in Killer Instinct. If you're crouching and you throw, you stand up and throw. So really, instead of frame traps and throw, Killer Instinct is very uh, neutral jump and throw mix-up heavy. And in fact, I mean, it's why a lot of Street Fighter players like Alex Vai like to play Killer Instinct because there is definitely a high level of similarities with Street Fighter 4. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of high-low stuff because a lot of the overheads lead into the combos. And, um, you know, this game can afford it, obviously, because there's a whole extra chunk of the combo breaker system on top of the game. 
But just in general, when you're trying to open people up in Killer Instinct, it's about that high, low, and the throw mix-up game. And that's how you're going to open people up. Um, Guilty Gear. And aka all the Arc System Works games. Very high-low based, very left-right based, especially with certain characters, and very throw based. If you guys uh, actually watch the uh, character tutorials that we went over, that Choice Us and I went over for Guilty Gear, there was a lot of characters like Mei and Zato and Soul that we basically said if they didn't have these command throws, they'd probably be pretty bad. And this is why, because they don't have enough mix-ups inherently built into them that without the command throw, they really can't get as much play. So in Guilty Gear, really, again, the throw mix-up is pretty big, but high-low is also super important because there's so many characters with really evil high-low mix-ups that lead into huge damage. Zato, for example, if he's got Eddie on top of you, he can hit you with an overhead, combo into the Eddie drill, into the Eddie saw blade, and then do some long combos. A lot of characters have mix-ups where they get lock you down, and when you're close and they get you to stand up, they catch you with the the, the 2K, the crouching kick, like I mentioned earlier. Very high-low centric game, but again, also very, very um, key on key on the, uh, the throw games as well. I didn't list chip damage here. Although there is chip pressure, the reason why I didn't list it is because there is faultless defense and you can green block a lot of things. <laughs> Which, by the way, prevents you taking from chip damage. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to mitigate that. Which brings me down to the last game that I have on this list here, which is Marvel. And this is going to illustrate to you why Marvel is the highest salt factor of all fighting games and why this game is so much more brutal than every other fighting game out there. And it's because literally the high-low, the left-right, the throw, and this is Marvel 3 specific, by the way, and the chip pressure are all so equally as effective in this game. If I had to rate them in order of effectiveness, I couldn't because that's how scary this game is. Box jumping from Dante is a left-right mix-up. So many of those triangle jumps, high-low mix-ups, everybody's throw leads to just gigantic gobs of damage, especially with TAC infinites and such like that. And then you've seen plenty of times when people just get chipped to death, you know, and, and they're dead. And this is exactly what makes Marvel such a scary game. And despite all this, you know, there's this whole concept of chicken blocking in the game where you jump in the air and block. You can block high-low, you know, all these sort of things. And, you know, there's nothing that can break your block. You can see why now, because the game is just too damn scary. And even while you're up there, you get air thrown, you're probably dead anyway, because most characters can kill you off of air throws as well. This is why Marvel is actually very hard to play and also very easy to play. It's hard to play because it's hard to block all of the mix-ups. It's very easy to play because it's probably the most training mode friendly game because once you come up with all of your crazy mix-ups, like if you learn zero incoming mix-ups and like maybe two other mix-ups, you kill the first character, you can kill their whole entire team. And you just did this all through training mode, right? So it's actually one of the very easier ways to, to, to <laughs> easier games to play from a one player standpoint. Um, but again, it's, it's really hard to play because uh, you have to keep track of all these things. And in fact, I mean, I, I know I've brought this up in previous uh, streams before, but I'll tell the story again. Uh, when I first started playing against Flo, what he would do is lock me down and he would use Dante. This was in vanilla Marvel. He had Dante with an assist of Wesker with the low gunshot. And what he would do is he would attack me, call Wesker, then box jump over me and basically hit me with a left, right and an up, down mix up at the exact same time. And I couldn't block it and I would die. And he did this to me like 90 times in a row. And I'm like, I don't understand. Like, how are you supposed to escape this mix up? And his answer was, you don't, you die. 
that, that's exactly what happens. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense because I never see you land this when you play against Justin. So he's doing something that, that he's not getting hit by this. And Flo's response was, yeah, he's not being put in that situation. And so you'll see now why Flo said that. Because the mix-up potential in Marvel is too strong. If you are getting mixed up, you've already made a mistake. The whole goal of Marvel is to avoid, 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 and then apply your mix-up. If they're trying to get to you and lock you down, you run away. Half the time you're going to die because you sat there and you blocked Amy's ice assist. You're dead. Because you blocked it, you let yourself get caught in the gigantic mix-up of all four options. So there's pretty much nothing you're going to do. So you got to run the entire time. But this is exactly why Marvel is such a scary game and why it also brings the most salt. Because a lot of the times when you do get hit by a mix-up, it's really not a mix-up. Because you're just going to get opened up. I've said this on commentary a million times. You can block the first two, three, four mix-ups, and then the fifth one opens you up and you're dead anyway. And that's the way Marvel works. That This is where the salt factor comes in because successful reads and blocks don't necessarily pay off for you. So, um, But yeah, so varies by game. And then I also want to do mention that within the games, there are exceptions themselves. So for example, Dudley in Street Fighter IV, if I go back here, I mentioned Street Fighter 4 is a very throw or a left and right heavy mix-up game. Not a lot of high lows. But Dudley completely throws that out of the book, throws that rule out of the book and he's just he's high low. His his high low pressure is ridiculous. And um, we've all seen this with Smug when he kills people really really badly. The one thing I do want to point out though is that when you watch Smug play, his high low game is really scary. But a lot of the times, that's he doesn't win off of the high-low mix-up. I want to go back to this again, that the mix-up often isn't what gets you the win. It's the threat of the mix-ups. A lot of the time, Smug is just so scary that you just start hitting buttons. Like, you block a low jab, and then you're like, all right, here we go. He's either going to low roundhouse me or low short me, or he's going to overhead dart shot me. So I've got to poke him. And then he catches you with the counter hit, low fierce in the stand roundhouse and the EX machine gun blow and then you just watch all your life melt away. It wasn't actually the overhead, the high-low mix-up game that he used to do the damage, it was the threat of it. But a lot of times you have to establish these things. You'll often see another thing that we talk about during commentary is someone will be going for a bunch of frame traps and I'm like, he hasn't gone for any throws yet. There's no reason for the opponent not to keep blocking because he has not established throw. Without establishing throw, frame traps are useless. So again, back to blocking is OP. Blocking is OP. The guy's just going to sit there and block. If you frame trap all day, who cares? Frame traps are useless. Frame traps are completely useless if the opponent's going to block all day. That's why you have to add the throw. You have to put the threat of the throw in there in order for the frame traps to work. Um, another example of uh, differences in the games are Blaze Blue, Amane. He's a character who's designed around the concept of chip damage. Even though the game isn't necessarily very chip damage heavy, Amane has setups that will put you in a crap ton of chip damage. Most of them are escapable, but that's the whole point, is that if you can get your opponent aware of what your chip damage setups are, that forces them to move, that's what opens them up, and that's what allows Amane to start applying landing hits. You're forcing the opponent into making mistakes. If I go back a bunch of slides here with the chip damage here, you'll see force opponents into actions slash mistakes. That's exactly what Amane is doing by having these really great setups for you to get chipped. Um, he knows the setups. He's hoping you know the setups. If you don't know the setups, then you're going to take a crap ton of chip. And then you're going to be like, I'm not taking that chip next time. And then you move and then Amane will blow you up. But, you know, that's the whole point is to force you into action. So, uh, blaze blue, blaze blue, blaze blue, whatever you want to call it. Um, next one is, for example, I mentioned in Mortal Kombat, throws aren't super effective in that game. 
uh, high low chip damage you don't really need throws obviously there's going to be exceptions and in fact this exception exists in almost every fighting game which is the grappler uh, Potemkin for example in Guilty Gear is the same kind of way um, you know the throw factor becomes a, a huge huge problem uh, with when it involves these uh, grappler characters so um, I want to talk about building off the mix-up so we've talked about all these mix-ups here and um, it's nice to have mix-ups. So let's say you go into a game. Let's say I'm picking up a new game and I'm playing Mortal Kombat here. And I'm saying like, look, I found this great string that starts from a low that's blockable. I mean, that, that, uh, that's safe on block. So I have this mix-up. And then the opponent, and then I also have a good mix-up that starts from an overhead um, that's also safe on block. So now I have this awesome mix-up here. I've got this high-low mix-up here. And so you're thinking to yourself, okay, I'm good, I'm good. I'm going to go into this game. I'm going to start playing against people. I'm going to start beating people with my high-low mix-up. What do you do when you run into an opponent who realizes that the overhead starts up super slow, so they're just going to low block your low attack, and then wait to see an overhead, and if they see the overhead, they're going to stand up on blocking. Your mix-up's useless, basically, because it's the only mix-up you have. And it's not going to get any, get you anywhere, because it's literally the only thing you have. And when you run into an opponent who all of a sudden cannot get defeated by the mix-up, you're basically SOL at this point, right? You're, you, you're, you're not going to win, because you can't open the opponent up. So in terms of mix-ups, you need a large repertoire. You need a lot of mix-ups. You have to... Sitting there in training mode and coming up with one or two mix-ups is not going to be enough. Even for a character like Zero on the incoming mix-ups, if you have two incoming mix-ups, a very basic hit from the left, a very basic hit from the right, it's not going to do you any good. You really need to develop a good left-right mix-up, a left-right and then a left mix-up, or a left mix-up that looks like it's going to be a right mix-up, but it actually turns into a left mix-up, or a left-right mix-up that actually just turns into an overhead, you know, or another mix-up that turns into a low. You know, you really have to develop the repertoire. If you, if you rely too much on the same mix-ups over and over again, you're basically not going to win. And the reason why you need a large repertoire is because you need backup plans. You have to have backup plans. If you do not have backup plans, you're done. There's too many times that I've seen players play in fighting games where they have two mix-ups, both of their mix-ups get defeated by the opponent, and it's proven very obvious that neither of the mix-ups are going to work. And then they're just like, well, I, 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 don't, I, I don't even know what to do. And then you can totally see it in their game. They just stop. They like stand there, and they don't even know what to do anymore. They, they're like, I, um, I'm just going to poke, and, I, uh, and then they die. Pretty much. And this happens so often. This happens way more than you guys think. And in fact, so many of the matches between a top level player and a lower level player, this is exactly what you're going to see. The, t the lower level player plays his cards. He shows all of his mix-ups, like all two or three of them, on the first game. And they work. They land on the opponent. They land on the top player and they're like, I'm feeling good. And the top player looks silly for one round or maybe even for the first game. But I've said this a million times. All these top players, they learn. And then the next two games, they blow the guy up super fast. It's because you showed all your mix-ups and then as soon as they the top player understands that and says, like, okay, here's the three mix-ups. This is what I'm going to watch out for. And all of a sudden, your mix-ups stop working. You're just like, I don't know what to do. You have no backup plan. You have no backup plan. You're done, right? I'll show you this in a little bit later on when I do the actual demo in Rising Thunder. I'll show you how certain mix-ups can lead into other mix-ups. And uh, just basically, you make sure you have back backup plans. When you have a large repertoire of mix-ups, another super important thing is saving your mix-ups. Save, save, save your mix-ups. I really, really get frustrated when I watch players play and they use all their mix-ups in the first round or in the first game. 
Like, here's this mix-up, here's this other sick mix-up, here's this next sick mix-up, haha, -ha. and they all branch off of each other off of the same mix-up, because you just showed everything that you had right away, and you have nothing you're saving in your repertoire. So, for example, in Rising Thunder, um, there's these cross-up moves that I'll get into a little bit early, a little bit later. This is down and C, universal cross-up moves for every character. I played the game online, as I mentioned earlier this weekend, and I fought against some people, and I would just hit them with the cross-up. No real setups, no real crazy mix-ups. It was just jump over them, do the cross-up, and they'd get hit by it. As soon as I saw them starting to get hit by that, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to keep trying this. I'm just going to keep doing this. Right? And I would do that. I would just jump cross up and hit him, jump cross up and hit him, and they kept getting hit by it. And so I was like, you know what? I've, I have no reason to mix this up. I have like three other mix ups, three other uh, decent mix ups. I'm not even going to bother using any of them right now because this one is still working. And the reason why this is important is because I fought one person who actually got hit by the cross up once or twice at the start and then started blocking them every single time. Now, had I just branched off and hit the cross-up the first time and then went to all these different mix-ups, I would have showed my cards right away. Instead, what I did was I, try, I just kept using the same mix-up until it stopped working. Once it stopped working, that's when I started going to some of my other mix-ups. That's when I started branching out to different ideas. So you're forcing your opponent to constantly adapt, and you always have a card in store. You always have a surprise factor for them. If you show all your tricks right away, like let's even say you built a great repertoire, you have six mix-ups, and in the first game you show all six mix-ups right away, and they work, and you beat the opponent. The next two games, he knows all your mix-ups, he's going to be aware of them, and so he's probably going to be able to defend against all of the mix-ups, decently. You know, if you're good enough, maybe not, and if it's Marvel, Marvel, most likely not, but still, you know, you need to save some of them because if they've seen all six of them, part of their brain can be devoted to reacting to them. And if you hadn't shown them before, you could have probably won with three of those mix-ups maybe. And then once he starts adapting to those three, you have a fourth one and maybe a fifth one to bust out all of a sudden. And you're going to catch him off guard and you can win crucial rounds that way. And then right at the end, you could pull out this Hail Mary sixth one that they were not, that they never saw at all. You can win entire games by saving your mix-up. I can't emphasize this one enough. I've talked about this a lot in a, different, a lot of different uh, first attacks I've done, but this one is so important, and it's one of the hardest things about playing online, especially playing ranked matches, because when you play them, you're not playing sets. When you play these people and you beat them after you play them, you may never see them again in your entire life. So what you get used to is you're like, let me do this trick, let me do this trick, let me do my next trick, let me do my next trick. They all work. I'm a god, and I'm amazing. Haha, <laughs> take that. And you're so focused on getting the win that you don't realize how much damage that's doing to your gameplay. You know, if you have a large repertoire of mix-ups, really, really learn to scale it back. Try not to use all of your mix-ups right away. Save them. Even when you play online, like I said, when I played online, when I was using one mix-up and it was working, I wasn't practicing any of the other mix-ups. I didn't care. I'm going to stay with this one mix-up because I need to learn how to play that way. I need to learn how to conserve my mix-ups because, like I said, they can win you rounds. They can just, they can be the key to winning entire tournament matches. And you'll see this always with top-level players. They win with the least possible. And it's only when it's proven to them that they need to bust out more stuff, that's when they start busting out stuff. Very, very important concept um, with mix-ups. And a lot of the times, you know, I talked about having a big repertoire. A big repertoire, like having six or seven mix-ups, eight mix-ups, whatever. A lot of good different mix-ups. Um, a lot of the times it's going to take improvisation. Because there are situations and there are some games, like Street Fighter, for example, there really aren't that many mix-ups. Like I said, the throw frame trap game is really, really a high portion of the mix-ups of the game. So you're not going to have this gigantic repertoire of gimmicks and you know shenanigans and tricks and, and mix-ups that you can bust out. And sometimes if your opponent figures them all out, you know, I mentioned how some people just lose their battle plan and they're like, 
I don't, I don't know what to do. And then you can see it in their gameplay and they just completely crumble. Uh, sometimes at the, I mean, a lot of times at the highest levels, you really do need to have good improvisation skills. This goes way past the whole concept of mix-ups and such though. Um, I just wanted to list this here because there is quite a possibility that you do follow everything. You have a large repertoire, you have backup plans, you're saving your mix-ups and then the opponent still blocks all of them and you're like, I don't know what to do. This is where the improvisation comes in, but this is where understanding the game system and understanding human psychology. Uh, I did a whole episode on different skill levels of players, um, you know, on, on, on basically archetypes of different levels of players. And the highest level of players, I, I mentioned improvisation is there, and this kind of goes with that as well. <clears throat> okay. So uh, last slide here before we go into the Rising Thunder demo. I will take a little break in between uh, so you guys can, you know, uh, rest up a little bit. But uh, some, some things that I want to mention here. So I've talked this whole episode about mix-ups. I've talked about high lows. I've talked about left-right mix-ups. I've talked about throw mix-ups. And I've talked about uh, chip damage pressure. A lot of these mix-ups require very specific setups. So for example, in Rising Thunder, I have a mix-up that involves close crouching light. If I'm right next to you and I do a crouching light, I have this godlike mix-up set up um, in Rising Thunder. The problem is your opponent's not going to let you get into that space. They're not going to just let you waltz up and be like, hey, come on in, do your low jab mix up to me. Hey, they're going to be poking at you. They're going to be keeping you out. They're going to be chucking fireballs. They're going to be doing everything they can to blow you up, right? So a lot of people ask this question a lot. What are footsies? What are fundamentals? What is the neutral game? I'm not going to go into details on how to play these things, um, on the concepts of it, but... Here is a great definition of what fundamentals slash footsies slash the neutral game is. What, what, what it is, what this concept is. It's really about how to get yourself into position to apply your mix-ups. This is why it's called fundamentals. This is why it's such a key thing to learn. Because even if you have all these godlike mix-ups, if you can't ever land them, what's the point? I've created so many amazing Felicia mix-ups in Marvel. And when I play against players, I can't land a single one of them. I can't land a single one of them because I can never get to the point where I can lock my opponent down and actually apply the mix-up. And that's because my neutral game in Marvel sucks. I have no neutral game in that. I do not understand the Marvel neutral game. And that is what has limited me in that game for so long. I had never understood it. I've never grasped it. And it took me too long to realize that that was my mistake. Why I could never land any of my mix-ups and such like that. Why I was having so many problems in that game. It took me too long to realize, you know what? It's because my neutral sucks that I can't get any play off of this. So the neutral game is the art of getting to the position where you can start applying your mix-ups. And it's all about positioning, positioning, positioning. It's all about learning where you are in correspondence to the opponent and trying to get to those certain spots. So like I said, I have a great mix-up that starts with crouching low, uh, with crouching light in Rising Thunder. And I said my opponent's not gonna give me the opportunity to get there, right? But I also talked about my jumping cross up down C move, right? In one of the previous slides, I mentioned backup plans. So when I first started playing against people and they get hit by my cross up all day, I'm like, fine, I'll just go ahead and keep doing this. I'll just keep doing this. So cross up, cross up, hit you, kill you, cross up, hit you, kill you. Then when you run into the opponent that starts blocking it, I immediately transition now into my crouching light mix up because the cross up puts me in that position. That's my backup plan. That's my branch. That's where I go to once they start blocking this cross up. I now have a new mix up off of my crouching lights and I can set it up because I landed this first mix up. But 
How do I even get to that point where I can cross them up in the first place? That's where footsies and neutral comes in. So all of these things you really have to pay attention to. So again, I mean, I, I, I might not be explaining this quite, I might not be emphasizing this enough the right way that I want to, but mix-ups are a result of the footsies. Mix-ups are your reward for good neutral game. The neutral game is what is played when neither character has an advantage. Frame advantage is such a huge thing. This is why cross-ups are so important. Or, or landing jump attacks, period. If you land a jump attack, that's the best way to get frame advantage. Your opponent is stuck. So a lot of the times when you land a jump attack, that's why it leads into frame traps in Street Fighter 4. You land a jump attack, you walk up, the opponent is stuck in all this block stun, you have all this frame advantage, the world is your oyster at this point in time. If you're blocking Zato, if you're blocking Eddie's saw blade, and, the, and Zato dashes up to you, you don't have to deal with the low block or the overhead or the command throw. The world is your oyster. Frame advantage is huge. Even something as simple as I mentioned the fireball game, the fireball pressure game. You'll notice that whenever Guiles play, if they just chuck sonic booms as fast as they can, they will lose every single time because they're just chucking sonic booms and it's not doing them any good. A lot of the times, you know you can throw a sonic boom when the opponent blocks one. So like, let's say you knock them down and you throw a meaty sonic boom, they get up and they block it and then you throw another sonic boom. When you throw that second sonic boom, they're in block stun. By the time they exit block stun, you've already exited your sonic boom animation. You're free to go. Suddenly, the frame advantage is on your side because you're both free to move, but there's this fireball on the screen that they have to deal with. If I chuck a sonic boom without any care and they jump over it with good reaction, I'm still stuck in the sonic boom. Suddenly they have all the frame advantage. Guile may be able to block the jump attack in time, but now he is in such a disadvantage because he's blocked the jump attack and now he's sub the guile is susceptible to all the mix-ups. So the opponent jumps in, lands a jump attack, walks up to you, now Guile has to deal with the mix-ups because he lost all the frame advantage. Another strategy with fireball players that you'll see is that they'll wait till you whiff a move and then throw a fireball. This is a very, very common tactic, a very, very common Choi slash Vi slash Daigo tactic. Watch how often they do this in fighting games. You guys are walking back and forth, you stick out a poke, it whiffs, they immediately fireball. And that's because you still have to recover from your move. There's no intention of them for whiff punishing you. Their goal is not to actually hit you with the fireball. Their goal is to have frame advantage. They throw the fireball, you're coming back, you can't jump, so you block the fireball at last second, now they chuck another fireball. Again, same situation as I mentioned with that Guile. You, they have frame advantage because you're blocking a fireball and they've thrown out a second fireball. Now you have to deal with this fireball on screen and you don't have the advantage of this big giant Hadouken delay, right? So again, landing a lot of your mix-ups is going to require the concept of frame advantage. You really, really have to understand how to use frame advantage and why frame advantage is so important. If you have moves that are plus on block, they give you the mix-up option. This is so important to emphasize and this is why blocking jump attacks is so bad. This is why, you know, certain moves are really, really scary to deal with like a Cody gut punch. You know, he slides forward and then he's just in perfect range for frame traps and stuff like that. This is a very important concept. Frame advantage is huge. And so, yeah, I just added a last bullet here. This is the neutral game. This is the neutral game. This is why it's so important. Now, every neutral game is different, right? Um, you really have to understand the neutral game. Like I said, I didn't understand Marvel's neutral game, and it hurt me. And it's a very different neutral game than all the other games. But that is what it is. That's why when you hear people talk about Marvel footsies, Marvel footsies is not walking back and forth, poking at each other. Marvel footsies is jumping up, throwing photon shocks, you know, and then, and then calling Strider to lock you down or Ami Assist trying to come in there. It's basically, Marvel has all this freedom of movement, so you're trying to control the space where they can go to lock them down so that you can apply your basically unblockable mix-up. That's Marvel footsies, right? Guilty Gear, kind of same way. Everyone has air dashes, everyone has high jumps, double jumps, 
all these air mobility. So the footsies in that game is very, very different than a traditional Street Fighter game. So much to the point that most Street Fighter players, when they go to Guilty Gear, they don't know what they don't know how to approach the game because it's so different because their movement options have opened up drastically. Um, and again, so something like Rising Thunder has a very similar footsie game to Street Fighter. So uh, when you approach Rising Thunder and you immediately make that assessment, you can start taking a lot of your uh, Street Fighter knowledge and applying it to Rising Thunder. Um, again, neutral game, it's, it's, it's probably one of the most fascinating parts of fighting games. And this is why, because it leads to the mix-ups. Neutral game is when both players are, have the same advantage. Mix-ups are when you have the opponent at a disadvantage and you have your opportunity to apply their mix-up. You're forcing them to deal with your offense, with your mix-up. And so, again, even though I've talked all about mix-ups this episode, ever, even though I talked about all the different kinds of mix-ups there are, if you don't learn the fundamentals, if you don't learn the footsie games, if you don't learn the neutral game, it's going to be really hard to apply your mix-up. So that's one thing I really, really want to make sure is clear, that just because you have the mix-ups doesn't mean you're going to start winning games. Because if you can never get into the position to apply them, that's a problem. And just because you have the mix-ups doesn't mean you're going to get to use them. Like I said, I had like 19 mix-ups with Felicia and Strider. Dude, I had mix-ups for days. I had so many amazing mix-ups in that game. And there would be matches, three out of five, that I would go 0-3 and, and I never even got to try a single one of them because my opponent was just never in the position that I wanted them to be in to apply my mix-ups. So just having the mix-ups isn't, isn't enough. You really do have to build up a lot of fundamentals to get there. Um, if you're playing against other players who don't have a lot of fundamentals, then it becomes a very mix-up heavy game. Low-level Mortal Kombat, for example, is just going to be blah, 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 high-low, high-low, high-low on, on top of each other. But once you get to high-level play, then that's where the footsies start really kicking in and such. So, Anyways, um, that's it for now. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a quick break, and I'm going to go into the Rising Thunder demo. I'm gonna, during the break, I'm going to bust out Rising Thunder. We're going to look at Edge, okay? So that's the character that I'm playing right now. He's already very good, so obviously he has a lot of advantages just in general. But basically, I just kind of want to show my thought process that I had with Edge when I first started playing with him. Uh, I played him, I messed with him in training mode, I took him online, and based on what I figured out, like I, I went undefeated the first day that I played, again, Edge is a really good character. Edge is so good. Oh my god, he's so good. But um, I did go undefeated. So a lot of the things that I applied, a lot of the mix-ups that I came with worked really well. And that's because I knew what mix-ups to look for while I was in training mode and I knew how to apply the mix-ups. So uh, once I come back from break, I'll show you the stuff that I came up with Edge, the reason why I came up with them and how I applied them. And I'll show you some example of branching and backup plans and stuff like that. So. Um, yeah, Edge is the red robot, the Chinese robot with the sword, who's very, very good. So, But uh, we'll take a quick break, and when we come back, um, we'll be going right into Rising Thunder. So stick around, guys. Uh, like I said, I'll be right back. <laughs> 